All right, let's stand up and begin with a prayer. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. And unto thee we ascribe glory together with thine unoriginate Father, and thine all holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Amen. Thank you. Okay, there's no one online, so I'm going to close out the meeting. All right. So I thought I've been taking notes as I've been reading different books. Some of you know this, that as I read through different spiritual books, I'll mark my readings like with, a, with an asterisk. If there's a, a quote, a, you might call it a quotable quote. Not just a good one or something, but something that I might want to use in the spiritual counsel that I give to people or in a homily or that I want to reread. If it's something that's just particularly profound or powerful. And I've been slowly collecting quotes from different books that I've been reading. And then what I can do, I don't always do it, but if I'm ever waiting somewhere in a line or something like that, rather than pulling my phone out, you know, to look at the phone, I'll pull out my little notebook that I have quotes written in, into, and got a little ribbon, you know, marker in the page, and I just kind of work through the, the quotes that I've been writing out. It is kind of tedious, you know, it takes time, but how do we, how do we learn things? How do we learn Mostly through repetition and through sl slowing down a little bit. To, especially in this information age, you know, there's so much information, especially so much orthodox information. I have an early, uh, early revelation as I was on my journey to orthodoxy. I would, you would always find me over by the church lending library. Because even about 17 years ago, when I started really taking my pursuit of orthodoxy seriously there weren't nearly as many publications in English. I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe a quarter of what we have now. It's just been incredible to see the flourishing of translations and publications of books these days. And uh, so I would always be at the church li lending library, grabbing books and having good conversations there. But then I, I thought, one day I was thinking about reading, well, I heard one one Orthodox commentator say, as a warning, it's easy to get enchanted with the externals of the faith and to buy icons and to buy books and just to have them. And she said, it's uh, Frederica Matthews Green. She said, more icons, less praying, more books, less reading. And at first I went, wait, what? Oh, yes. That is something we need to be careful about. You know, we have to be careful. You can have many icons of all these different saints, but are you following their example? Are you standing before the icon corner and taking time to pray, you know? All of these books, this is a, a judgment that falls upon me all the time. Even though I have like 30 books stacked on my desk all the time that I'm in and out of, but, um, you know, there are many books that I haven't read yet. And I recently told myself, you're not buying any more books, Father, until you have read the majority of the books that you have on your shelf. And I have a pretty good library at home right now. Um, then I had this little thought. My personal thought was, you could always read a million pages. You could read a million pages. You could read a million pages but you could also read a million at one. 
Meaning it's not about the quantity, you know what I mean? You could, you could read more and more, but the purpose of the reading is to try to uh, assimilate into our lives, you know, to adopt the practices that we're reading about. And as one of my friends, who's a, a very wise older priest, says, you know, we read many beautiful writings on the spiritual life, on the life in Christ, and we think, I'll never be like that. No way. How could I ever? You know, you just read the way of the ascetics. It's like, what in the world? Should I just turn around and walk the other way? But he has a beautiful little phrase, approximate in your life what it is that you're reading about. So do that which is, and this is the constant counsel that I give people, do that which is in accordance with your ability. So I'm reading about these monks who, you know, sleep three hours and they pray eight hours in the middle of the night and they do thousands of prostrations and, you know, it's like, okay. But also, one of my favorite contemporary elders, Elder Ephraim of Katunakia, said something like this. I'll just summarize. He said, if he lived in a little wilderness area, a very small monastery in a remote area where they dedicated their life to prayer. And he said, if I in the wilderness of Katunakia do a thousand prayers in my solitude and in my silence. And someone in the center of Athens, you know, the hubbub of the city, does five prayers on a given day. We're the same. Do you understand that? He doesn't say, oh, they're deficient and they should be, you know, they should have become a monk instead. And no, that's not the point. Now, I, was, I think about this all the time because people struggle with the idea that we're reading all these books by monks and nuns and this, but we're not monks and nuns. Well, it's because they have the time to write books. You know, the people who are living in the world, who are in the church and in the world and raising families, very few of them have the time to, to, to sit down and write. You would, you would read a book about um, cardiovascular health by a doctor, you know, of, by a heart doctor who has experience operating on people and working with patients, not some guy who has opinions about, you know, a school teacher. You wouldn't read a book on cardiovascular health by a school teacher. And the same goes for the spiritual life. These are the, the, the practitioners of the inner life, and these are the people who are the experts. We could call them the doctors of, of the faith, you know, who have committed their life to learning and experiencing what it means to, um, to pursue healing. And then they, they write in order to convey something of what they've learned to us, something of the great mystery that's really beyond our comprehension. And that's another thing that's a little frustrating about the spiritual reading, you know. It's like, it's always a little beyond, but that's good. Because we should never be satisfied in the spiritual life. Never. Otherwise, what you found is not God. There's a sense of satisfaction. A sense like, this is what I want. Wow. I've never experienced anything like this. And people... People get that little sense of satisfaction, especially if they kind of miraculously find orthodoxy and they didn't know it was there. And they're like, whoa, whoa, this exists. And then they come and they're kind of enchanted with orthodoxy. And then they have to deal with themselves. Oh, wait. You know the old saying, wherever I go, there I am? Yes. So the church is there, but if I go there, there I am too. And so... The next wonderful crisis gets to take place. Your identity crisis. And like I was telling you. And I almost thought about giving a homily on this. That the Christian life is just a constant identity crisis. <laughs> you know we talked about that this week. But, uh, you know, I have great conversations with people throughout the week. And it gives me you know, some things to think about. And, um, but it really is. Because if you're entering into a, a relationship. What we might call a relationship with the uncreated God, um, then you are, you're confronted with 
what is the source of all of life and reality, but which, that which is really beyond your, you know, your comprehension. And the more you come into contact with that, the more you enter into that great mystery, in a healthy way you start to question, oh my God, who am I? What am I really? Saint Sophroni was giving a talk. Saint Sophroni founded a monastery in Essex, England. He was a, he, he's Russian, but lived on Mount Athos. He was a monk, a hermit for a long time. Left Mount Athos to go to France to publish a book on his elder, Saint Silouan. Almost died due to health issues there, but kind of recovered. The story is amazing. And then people started to gather around him while he was in this kind of convalescent home. And he started teaching prayer, on, teaching them on prayer. He's in this Russian convalescent home. And uh, he started doing better, and they asked him to start a monastery. And so he ended up starting a monastery in uh, England because he couldn't start one in, in France due to some of their, their political... Uh, requirements regarding starting a new church community. So they found land in England and he started a, a monastery in England. And uh, he was giving a talk at uh, one of the universities there. And some, you know, smart, very clever university student got up and said, You've been talking about God so much, so just tell me what God is. Like, you know, the, the, uh, the mic drop, as they say, moment, you know, the nail in the coffin or something. And he said, okay, but first, you can you tell me what man is? You just tell me what man is, and then I'll tell you what God is. And he went, you know, I don't know. You know, he couldn't even, he couldn't even say what man is. And uh, I always look at that as a, you know, it's kind of a consolation because that is... <laughs> You know, you look at yourself. Have you ever had that experience? You look at yourself in the mirror and you go, who is that person? You know? And especially when you start really following God. You know, it's interesting. Everything that you thought you knew about life and about yourself and your identity comes into question. I think, what is going on here? Do I really want to ride this wave? And you don't have to. I mean, you can get off at the next island where there's a McDonald's and a Taco Bell and a... You know, and a, I was going to say Phil Donahue, Oprah Winfrey and whatever, you know, um, Dr. Phil that will talk to you about feeling good about yourself. You know what I mean? Or you can ride that wave all the way to the kingdom of God, you know. But, you know, you will lose yourself along the way in order to find yourself. And this is, forgive me for sounding philosophical, but it is it is an existential crisis because you come to the the question of who am I? I don't, I don't know who I am. And you take a great risk before God. Saying, I don't really know who I am. I could make myself into something. And many of us have tried that. Through codependent relationships, through addiction, through hard work, through all kinds of things. I could make myself into something. And that would be something. Or if I do... Believe in God, and then I say, not just believe, like I said in the homily today, but if I have faith in God, then I could be made into something greater than I could make myself. Other, very different, other than what I could make myself into. But I could be conformed to the likeness of God, which is what we're called, what we're given the option of doing. But it's a great risk, too. There's always that question, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? I heard someone say, I forgot who it was. It might have been the late Professor Yaroslav Pelikan. He said something like, if, if the resurrection of Christ took place, nothing else matters. And if the resurrection of Christ didn't take place, then nothing else matters. You know? No, no, yeah, or you could say, yeah, nothing matters. Uh-oh, <laughs> better go get a bag of chips and take a nap or something like that. So what are you thinking about? Yeah, I was going to ask, is this that existential crisis that we feel the way? No. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but, 
But it's a good one. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's not, you're not in a constant state of duress, though. Because God does comfort you. And He lifts you up. Like when you think, when you think that you've fallen enough, you fall a little further and then you get lifted up because you're no longer relying on yourself. I mean, the ego is... Uh, this is the one atrophy that we need to take place. The, we need the ego to atrophy. And we think, okay, the, my ego is atrophied enough. I think I've given enough. Nope. A little bit more. Like, give a little bit more than you can. I guess there was you know? a question. Like, what do you mean by existential crisis? Because since a young age, I've, I guess, always thought about very mm -hmm. existential things. Yeah. Like, aside from God and religion and all that. So, but, some people are more, um, more inclined toward the mystical life. The mystery of life and the unknowability of things and so you know for some people they 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 they're not trying to define everything but they're striving to experience things and then their crisis is a little different how do i know if my experiences are authentic then you know what i mean if i'm if i'm more of and like we've talked about a little bit if i'm sense that i'm a little more of an intuitive person a person of the heart, maybe, than a person of the head. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not as calculated. But then, how do I distinguish between what is what is me? You know, it's just the machinations of myself, or of of God. You know, of reality. So, and those are things I'm not going to answer in one. You know, in a lesson. Those are things we kind of work through together with time. But what's on your mind? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Saint Sophronia has this yeah. beautiful quote, which actually he told he told someone and the guy was just kind of devastated by it. You know, he said he said to someone in the monastery, stand at the brink of this disp despair, and when you can handle it no longer, then have a cup of tea. And uh, that kind of you know, it's kind of cute in a way. Uh, because everyone likes the idea of having a cup of tea, but we don't really like the idea of standing at the brink of despair. And but the what is the brink of despair? What is it? I mean, it's where I, the limitation of my existence comes to an end. And either, like you were saying, either there's nothing, nothing else matters, or there is something. There is hope. I talked about that. A week or two ago in, in a homily too but um, anyway yeah that's right it's kind of like it's another version of keep thy mind in hell and despair not you know by Saint Siloan Saint, Saint Sophroni kind of softened a little bit by throwing in the, the cup of tea which we like you know, or maybe coffee we would like a, you know sit take a cup of sip a cup of coffee are you guys coffee drinkers no tea, no hot beverages. No? Cranberry juice. Cranberry juice. Okay, all right. So okay, you can step outside. Then. <laughs> no. Okay, come back. You know what? Uh, we love you unconditionally. So anyway, I've been trying. I've been trying to to balance the digital life with the analog life, and so. Um, you know, I'm reminded of a little story when the power was flickering a while back, a couple years ago, and someone got in touch with me and said, Father, what are we going to do for church if the power goes out? You know, in the winter. And I said, we're going to have church. We have candles. You know what I mean? It's like, but um, also, I've probably said this in the past too, but uh, forgive me if it's a repetition. But... Uh, I saw a little, do you guys know what a meme is? Yeah. A little picture with a clever little quote or something. I saw a meme once that said, uh, that said, uh, my phone died so I can't read the Bible today. And so, you know, I don't want that to, to be the case for us either. So we should, always, we should always be rooted in the physical world while seeking to understand our identity as members of the kingdom of God. So I always, just so you know, I always carry a little, a full Bible with me. I carry a little one in my pocket, but I also have some 
a notebook handy, especially the one I've been writing quotes in. And I went on this huge tangent with you guys because somehow, because I just wanted to share a couple quotes that I wrote down this week. I thought that might be kind of a nice thing for me to do with you on occasion is, as I'm writing some quotes down and things, maybe for your edification and my reinforcement. Um, and, you know, I have a pen. I have this real... Talk about an existential crisis. I don't want to write in pen because I don't want what I write down to be permanent in any way for some reason. I just realize, like, I'm going to come and go, and so the notes on my, the pages of my notebooks will come and go, and I'm, I'm not hope, I don't hope that, like, some people, you know, in 2,000 years are going to find my notebook and say, this is what people were like in Briar, Washington, or something like that. <laughs> so I write, I write in pencil, and then also I can erase, you know, and make corrections as I go, but um, a couple, of, a couple of quotations. Let me see. Oh, and this is where it gets a little complicated. I have two notebooks. I have one kind of for my everyday little... I write down notes from daily Bible reading and uh, things like that. Or little random thoughts. Things that I'm that I not, I won't necessarily go back to to you know to to quote in a homily or something like that, but just a way of processing what I'm experiencing on any given day. And uh, anyway, a couple things that came up in the reading. I was reading about uh, Elder Moses of Optina, a Russian Orthodox monastery, and I I wrote this down. It was said of Elder Moses of Optina. He wasn't very talkative that when he had listened to someone speak, he often responded with an eloquent silence. Eloquent silence. I love that. And when he spoke, his words were intentional. So I th that, even that term, eloquent silence, I thought, wow, that is something that I can aspire toward. An eloquent silence. A lot of times when we're silence, silent, we're stonewalling. Have you ever, ever heard that term? I'm not going to say anything. Um, rather than an eloquent silence, which is one where you pause and decide whether or not something needs to be said through prayer. You know, Pause and say, at least mentally, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And sometimes then the next word is, so shut up. Or, okay, you need to speak a word, you know, of kindness, of gentleness. He's the one that I read um, who had that line about attending Orthros and orth coming, coming to Orthros being an offering of yourself and then the liturgy being Christ's offering of himself. And I thought that was very beautiful. And then I'll read a couple of quotes and then we'll actually get into our, our subject matter. Because catechism is not supposed to be about me just uh, talking. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, just a sec. Um, so when Elder Moses of Optina was a, a young man, he encountered St. Seraphim of Sarov. Has anyone heard of St. Seraphim of Sarov? If you haven't, um, you should explore. You should get to know him. He's really wonderful. Yeah, we have him. Spent a thousand nights in prayer on um, kneeling on a stone. He lived in the wilderness. He was very humble. He befriended a bear whom he fed. And just beloved, joyful. And he's known for saying to people, which I hope maybe someday I can do it without it feeling forced. Every time he encountered someone, he said, Christ has risen, my joy. He called everyone his joy. Christ has risen, my joy. And he wore a white cassock because the white cassock is always, uh, white is always uh, an indication of celebrating the resurrection. Mm. So he wore a white, he's known for his white cassock. I wear the black cassock of repentance for now. Although we have the blessing to wear a white cassock during the bright season, I just don't own one yet. So maybe someday. 
But he encountered Saint Seraphim, Elder Moses did, when, his, um, when he was younger. And Saint Seraphim said this, and I think is very instructive. Saint Seraphim said, while you are standing in church, you must say the Jesus prayer. Then you will also hear the church service distinctly. <coughs> now, have you noticed that you have kind of two channels in your mind at any given time? You could be singing along or hearing the church service and then you're thinking about lunch or, you know, your friend or the movie that you want to watch this evening or something like that. Well, you can use prayer to occupy both channels. Some people will say you shouldn't use the prayer rope, you know, when you're in church because it's a personal form of prayer and we're in the service to worship corporately as a body together. Um, but you're not really worshiping corporately if you're kind of in the service, but half in Australia or somewhere else, you know what I mean? Or the conversation you had yesterday or the work that you have to do tomorrow. So if you're trying to be present in the service, you can also try to be spiritually present through prayer. So if you occupy one, you could say channel of the mind through the simple Use of the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. A constant, constancy of prayer. That's the goal. Not repetition, but constancy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. While simultaneously listening to the service and participating, then there's nowhere else to go. Give yourself, give it a try. And if it's too much, then don't take a cup of tea, but just... Pause for a second, because most of our minds are not our minds are not used to being controlled, dominated in that way. You know, our minds are like little children who have too much freedom, and uh, the moment you give them a little discipline, they rebel. So give your mind a little bit of discipline, give it a little reprieve, and then a little more discipline. Give that a try, and if you use the prayer rope, say the Jesus prayer during the service. Also, don't say it out loud so that other people can hear you saying the words, you know, but do it quietly, you know, mentally while participating in the service. Something, it's something that you can do. It's a recommendation. And if anyone wants to talk more about their inner life of prayer or anything like that, the wandering thoughts, go find an elder. Some, no, I'm just kidding. You can talk to me about it. I'll support you. Okay, Elder Moses also said, they lived so simply and gratefully they only had what they received what they were given you know when they like he he started by living as a a monk in the wilderness so sometimes they would run out of certain things what what a crisis it is when you run out of margarine or olive oil or butter at home. You know, have you ever had that? We can't have, there's nothing to eat now. We're out of margarine or something like that, you know. And he said something so sweet and simple. He said, when it happened that we ran short, we would eat our food without oil, valuing spiritual freedom and stillness above all. I love just little, little bits of sim simple wisdom like that are to be found. You know, this is not highfalutin noetic theoria, as we would say, like, you know, the third heaven or something like that. This is people who are just saying, God will be sufficient for me then. If, rather than having a, an unnecessary crisis, you know, then God will be my portion and I'll be thankful for what I have. And then when he provides the oil or when I have time to go to the store tomorrow or something like that, then it'll be okay. But no one can deprive you or any of us of prayer. That's one thing that no one can take away from you. Someone could walk, march into your home and take all the margarine out of your refrigerator or the butter or the whatever you like. And you could say, hmm, that's really sad. I was planning on using that tonight, but I'm still gonna say my prayers tonight. You know what I mean? They say, oh, take your prayer book. Okay, I have some prayers memorized. You know what I mean? Like, 
Some, there is something that cannot be taken away from you. And actually, if anyone were to march into your home and try to take your physical things away, whatever your possessions are, um, it could actually enhance your prayer. I don't, I, I don't hope that that happens to anyone. I don't want you to go through that kind of crisis. But prayer is something that can never be removed. Like um, self-deprivation, like simplicity, is something that no one can take away. People can't force decadence upon you. You know what I mean? They can't force materialism upon you. Or dissatisfaction. They cannot force, you know, dissatisfaction upon you. It's a choice. A lot of those things are choices that we have to make. But they also cannot take God away from you. That's what we give away. We give away when we don't have what has made us so comfortable. And we forget. We forget what's most important, what's most needful. It's very important to think about. Anyway, all from just one little, you know, half sentence quote that I have in my little notebook here. So there's so much wisdom. You know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, this is what we should be longing for, that we have ears to hear. And not only to hear, but to, uh, to receive, in other words, the wisdom that's being spoken to us through the scriptures and the lives of people who have taken the teaching of the scripture and the church seriously and applied it to their lives. And so that's why we do spiritual reading and um, writing quotes down and quoting so much, you know, so often. So anyway, I just wanted to share some things with you. Uh, you had a... When you say what? Uh, when you're talking about when you kind of stay silent or you choose to either say something and not say anything. Mm -hmm. So you choose to say it just for the kind words. And I was wondering about what you, how you define kind in this case. Because oftentimes I feel like saying the right thing isn't necessarily the important thing. I'm writing on the whiteboard for the I'm recording our session for people who can't be here but do the least selfish thing or you could say say the least selfish thing and this is something that requires practice you know so being kind is being less selfish you could say I don't think most of us know how to be selfless but we can be less selfish you know what I mean and if you become selfless, then you, then you won't know whether or not you're being selfless. Because it won't matter. Does that make sense to you? And that's an advanced, that's an advanced state of being that very few people really attain. But we can do the least selfish thing. Um, that's, you know, it, we believe that it's possible. You know. But anyone who has attained that level of selflessness would never claim it. So, you know, I think of St. Paisios, you know. Um, you, know you, you probably haven't read about him yet, but the time will come, you know, eventually. There are a lot of people to get to know over the, you know, in the, in the days to come. And, uh, you know, I think he got close. I mean, a lot of the saints, St. Saint Siloan, you know. Um, I mean, I, I go to a lot of contemporary people because we have lots of their writings and I've had a lot of exposure to them. But uh, I do believe it is possible. But again, no one who has attained that would ever claim that they had. They would just they would just attain they would claim their own imperfection and the perfection of Christ. And that's why the the church the church validates the holiness of people. It's not like, you know, you're you're right by the icon of Saint Herman. It's not like Saint Herman said, Ah, well, I know I'm a saint now. You know, he's like he says, he, oh, I, what's that beautiful quote by St. Herman? I don't remember. Oh, 
I don't know. I mean, just a simple, it's like a, something about every every breath being given to God, you know. I, I'll have to look it up and send it to you guys or quote it next time. But, you know, he would just say, just God is everything, you know. And the people would say, wow, he became transparent to the love of God. Wasn't that like how he kind of ministered to the local people too, was they would go outside and open their mouths to the sun in the morning or something like that? And he talked about like the breath of God being in them. Or, is, am I totally off? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. But, but he did meet the natives with their, you know, he found the goodness yeah. in what they believed in. And he said, what you're aiming for can be fulfilled in this God who revealed himself as Christ and you know what I mean and gives the, the gift of the Holy Spirit so he didn't go in and say oh you're all wrong about everything and you know um, pagans or something like that you know he was sensitive to what they were looking for and he saw Christ as the fulfillment of what it is that, that they were aiming for mm -hmm. and then can correct the you know correct the the, the incorrect misunderstandings with time, but through gaining of trust. But St. Herman of Alaska. There's a really incredible book. If anyone's interested in, in orthodoxy in America, there is a really neat book. It's a little historical, but it's also kind of, it's kind of a, kind of a historical book, but also there are writings of different orthodox missionaries who came into Alaska, writings of saints, and uh, I think it's a really good book. It's called Orthodox Alaska. Orthodox Alaska. Has anyone been to Alaska? Have you seen Orthodox churches around in Alaska? There are quite a few up there. By Father Michael. Father Michael. Oleksa. Not Oleska, but Oleksa. You picture like the letter X, but it's K-S-A. Father Michael Alexa, and we, we have it in our bookstore downstairs. And there are little le like letters and quotes from interactions with St. Herman of Alaska. It's a really precious book if you want to learn about how Orthodoxy came to the United States through immigration, you know, from, from Europe and people who are fleeing persecution and seeking success and things like that. But also missionaries came uh, through... Russia, Siberia, around into Alaska. Mm -hmm. And that's a long, long story that I could go into, but I don't think I have time to do it right now. But uh, you'll, you would learn some of the best source material on um, St. Herman of Alaska. And there are books about St. Herman. I can write his name down, too, if, uh, if you're interested. We have his icon um, painted by our iconographer up on the upper left-hand side of the church, on the other side of the, the beer. It's called the B-I-E-R, mm -hmm. St. Herman of Alaska. He lived on Spruce Island, which is a little, little tiny island. Like I don't know, it's like 17 miles across or something like that. Um, okay. Huh? They, they wouldn't know. I would say like, like St. Paul, I claim to know nothing but Christ and Christ crucified. They would know, this is what they know. They've come to know the love of God. And that's what they know more than some subjective knowledge. The scales have tipped. And an interesting thing about coming to the knowledge of God is that you become more acutely aware of the, the meaning and purpose of creation, too. Of the created world, and then of what is contra-natural, you would say, in the people you encounter. And through having known Christ and Christ crucified, and loving the world as God's creation, you start to love people as those created in God's image, 
And then there's, there's a true intuition that takes place. Where people like St. Paisios and St. Porphyrios, you know, contemporary saints would say, a person would come up to me and I would know what was wrong with them. But I wouldn't tell them about it without their permission. Which is different than, different, different than what like gurus and swamis and you know, people who are doing mind control would do. But they would, they would only use that actual true intuition for the benefit of another person when the person desired it, desired to receive that love. There's a book called The Gurus, The Young Man, and Elder Paisios that you might find interesting in that regard. I'll write it on the board. I don't remember the name of the author. Sorry about my writing. Guru is the young man and Elder Pisces. I think the author's last name is Horasiotis. Uh, because it's, I think it's a pseudonym because he's from Ferasa, from the, where St. Pisces came from. Uh, but I, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, if you... Is that right? Yeah. Okay. My daughter has read it. My daughter's 15 and a half. Kind of precocious, but, you know, it's a, it's a really incredible story and touching. And it does answer some of the questions that people have. Like, you're getting into all this mysticism and orthodoxy. Well, what about Eastern mystics? What about their approach to spirituality? And this book addresses some of that. And then actually, there's one, have you ever read Father Damascene's book? Christ the Eternal Tao. Oh. Um. We're really taking all kinds of twists and turns today. And this is um, Father Damascene. Christensen, is his name. Uh, I don't know if it's E N or O N. But uh, anyway, anyone who's interested in these kinds of things, can check. There we go. Do we have time to get into the birth and mission of the church? Oh. I don't know. Should I talk about other things instead? What's that? Let's see. How long is this uh, section? Let me look really quick. I don't know. <gasps> Who was that? Um, yeah, we can, we can delve in, and we'll just get as far as we go. Would you guys like to... Take copies, pass them around of the, the text here. Oh, you bought a copy, huh? Yeah. Read through this in June. Mm -hmm. It's good to it. Yeah. I use it as, as, a, as something to keep me on track. And it is, it's a good overview. What's that? Uh, yeah, well, implying it mostly keeps me on track. Otherwise, yeah, if I didn't have it, I would have a little, like I like to say, I would have a little too much fun. And catechism would take six years instead of one or three. Yeah, three-year catechism. That reminds me, I have a book that I want you two to read called The Life in Christ by St. Nicholas Cavasilas. And it's about the meaning of the sacraments. It's, an, it's a very classic book, and you should just read it together and you know, talk about it. Okay? I'm thinking about starting to assign that to everyone after they've been baptized to read The, the Life in Christ by St. Nicholas Cavasilas. So, 
Let's talk about the birth and mission of the church, which I do not think we'll do in uh, full today, but maybe we will. We still have a half an hour together. The church is, at least on the surface level, the historical body of Christ. Do you want to follow on with Daniel there? Oh, chapter 10. Do you guys know what page it is? Chapter 10, the birth and mission of the church. There should be a, like a table of contents in the front. 153. And again, I don't know if having the book in front of you is helpful at all. It might be just more annoying. Because, because I, I read a little bit and comment a little bit. And, um, but it gives you something to look at. Rather than my mug. So the church is the historical body of Christ whose mission is to manifest Christ's loving presence to the whole world. Before his passion, Christ promised his disciples that he would not leave them comfortless in John 14. What is Christ's passion, by the way? What, is, what does that word passion mean? don't know. Suffering. Passion. Pathos. The Greek word means um, suffering. What is it? How does it feel like that? Or is it an omega? Anyway. Pathos. Like from, from which we get the word pathology. So, um, so his passion, his, and some of you were touching on it, like his self-giving, his pouring out of himself. And, but uh, so he was getting the disciples to, to prepare themselves for what was to come so that they would not lose hope when they saw him crucified. That's also what he was doing, if you guys remember, that's what he was doing at the Transfiguration. So he also gave them this promise that he would send another comforter to them. He promised to send the Holy Spirit who would teach the disciples all things and bring to remembrance all the things which Jesus had taught. This is, it is the Holy Spirit who unites us with the risen and ascended Christ. Christianity is therefore not simply a philosophy or of life or a set of rules to follow. As I like to tell people, that would be too easy to just have a philosophy or a set of rules to follow. It's a living relationship with Christ himself in the Holy Spirit. This relationship is the life in the church. And I think there's even a better word than relationship. Relationship's a pretty good word, but it's not good enough. So if I wrote my own catechism book, I've thought about taking this book and just kind of editing it however I want, but I do that anyway as I'm speaking. Relationship. What do you think would be a better word? Union. <laughs> Sorry. You give me the chills. <laughs> Union or communion. Yeah, which communion just means union with. But being united. So being closer, closer than just uh, like proximity, you know, being you and I could be as close as possible. I could be giving you a really good bear hug. And I could know you really well. But that's not the same as being in communion. It's like I can smell, I can smell and touch and taste, you know, in a way. But until something enters into my being, then it becomes assimilated with me. It becomes a part of who I am. And that's what happens. You know, the word, the word Holy Spirit, 
as I, I think I mentioned it before in a, one of the last sessions, recent session, the word pnevma in Greek is, is the word that we get spirit from. It means like breath. And so the breath of God is our life, even more so than the actual air that we breathe. And that makes this kind of, I don't know, what do I want to say, su supra-rational? Makes it beyond merely human logic. So it's more than just a relationship, I would say, just to add to that comment there. Now, our Holy Fathers teach us that the persons of the Trinity always work together in concert. In particular, the Son and the Spirit complement one another as they accomplish the will of the Father. And that's why St. Irenaeus referred to them as the two hands of God. God spoke the world into existence. And the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. Genesis 1. God created man in his own image. Again, Genesis 1. And by his Spirit breathed into man the breath of life. Genesis 2. When for the salvation of mankind, the Word of God, Christ, the Word with a capital W, when the Word of God assumed our human nature, it was the Holy Spirit who came upon the most pure virgin and affected the incarnation. And when our Lord was ready to begin his ministry, it was the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove who descended upon him after his baptism and anointed him to be the Messiah of Israel. Thus it was that when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in the upper room, on the day of Pentecost, they ceased to be mere followers of Christ and became the church, the very body of Christ. See, they became, I like this term, um, corporate, corporate, because it comes from the word corpus, which means body. So corporate worship means we worship as a body, we become incorporated. Incorporated, we became, become, or to use another metaphor that Christ uses, engrafted. Is it with an F? Engrafted into the living vine, which is Christ. You know, not just a parallel vine, engrafted into the vine that has Christ as its very life, its very source. So. The church is the body of Christ. And we take that really seriously in the, in the Orthodox Church. In the Nicene Creed, we do not say that we believe that there is one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We say we believe in the church. The church is an object of faith. This is so because she is Christ's body, animated by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote that the church is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1.23 We may not think of the church as simply a religious organization. It's not just an institution. Everyone thinks about, the, oh, you know, the institutional church, blah, blah, blah. You know? And I would like to say, this is something that kind of woke me up a little bit. You know, we all want to... We all hear what kind of what we want to hear. And uh, I was, you know, I wanted, I didn't want to believe in the institutional church because I, th I thought that uh, it was like a bunch of old people with, you know, um, suits and ties who were kind of boring and telling people what to do, you know, growing up and playing music that was not that interesting. And so I thought, okay, what's the, you know, oh, that's the institutional church, a bunch of, you know, Decrepit old men telling people what to do. But, uh, but then I realized, wait, what does the word insti institution mean? It means uh, something that was instituted. So the body is, uh, the church is an institution in as much as it was instituted by Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Now we can corrupt that and turn it into a human institution, but it really is an institution in a way in that it was instituted. So that word's not necessarily a bad word. It just depends on what we mean when we say that. You know, something worth thinking about. You know, just 
little, little corrections that give us, you know, little course corrections that we need along the way. Rather than just outright saying, oh, institutional Christianity is so man, man-made and stuff like that. Organized religion. Well, you know, what I like to say, if, if you're looking for organized religion, don't become Orthodox then. Because uh, <laughs> we're not that organized. <laughs> so, okay. Jesus did not promise us an organization. He promised to build his church, which would withstand the gates of hell. Nevertheless, we should not make the opposite mistake of thinking that the church is something so spiritual that she has no real existence in the world. The church is not now and has never been invisible. Was Christ invisible? No. No. You know, or was like one arm, you know, detached from another arm or one of his legs was somehow his body was a visible unity? No. I mean, invisible unity. No. And so we see, we see the church as something that's real, a real living organism. And we confess that the church is apostolic. Apostolic. Do you guys know what that word apostolic means? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. So that's the apostles and apostolic have the same root and the same intention behind them. Does anyone know what that means? What does apostle mean? Theology student. You don't know? Ha! Yeah? To send forth. One who is sent is an apostle or apostolic is being sent forth. That's correct. Yeah. Good job. And I'm not, I'm teasing you a little bit. I'm having fun with you, just so you guys know. I'm not here to humiliate anyone. Uh, And you know, the reason I know the word is because I didn't know it at one point in time, and then I learned it, so. Uh, But the church is apostolic, and in doing so, we're making claims about her origin, her life, and her mission in the world. We don't send ourselves out, for example. You know, know, there's, there's one who does the sending. So there are two dimensions to the apostolic nature of the church. On the one hand, the church is an an historical entity, a visible human community which dates from the time of the apostles. So there is a continuity that has taken place from that place and that time when God became man and had his disciples and who gathered around him and who chose to follow him after his death and his resurrection and to share what they believed. So we shall refer to this as the horizontal dimension Horizontal. On the other hand, the church is an image of the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, the church is our participation in heavenly realities. We shall refer to this as the vertical dimension. Oh, interesting. I just drew a cross on the board. The cross teaches us everything. Both of these dimensions are essential to the being of the church. Without both aspects, no group of Christians can be called the church. And in this chapter, we'll focus on this section. We'll focus on the the horizontal dimension. And then later, we'll focus on the vertical. There are four aspects to the horizontal dimension of the church's life. First of all, the church is an entity. It is. This is not the most important one, by the way, but it is it is uh, appealing to people, and it is, it is helpful that the church is an entity which exists in history. I'll, I'll write these on the board. Okay, it's a historical entity. When our Lord became incarnate, he assumed human nature in its entirety, and yet because humanity does not exist in the abstract, he became a single concrete human being. He existed in space and time. So when we say that the church embraces the totality of the kingdom of heaven, we do not imply that she is invisible. Of course, the church did not limit, uh, is not limited to her visible historical face any more than Christ is limited to his visible human nature. Remember, it's the fully God and fully man, perfect union of the human and the divine. Yet Christ did have a visible human nature, 
that one could see and touch. One of my favorite passages is 1 John 1. 1 John 1, 1 and following. Read it. I won't read it to you right now. It's a beautiful explanation of the incarnation. And I feel like it's the perfect um, defense or explanation. I don't even know. I don't think we need to defend it. Explanation, explanation for the use of icons in the church. First John 1. So I'll give you that's your task. Read First John in your Bible. It's epistle. The epistle of John. Not the gospel of John. First John 1. But you should read the gospel of John. <laughs> you should read the gospel. What's up? I was saying, I wrote, you should. Read you should, but I'm, that's not what I'm assigning. I'm not assigning John 1. Although if you read John 1... You'll kind of get the same message, too, from the gospel. But anyway, so the church has a concrete, visible nature. She is the historical apostolic community made up of real people and not merely some, someone's idea of a perfect society. It's not just a, as people love saying these days, it's not just ideological. Second, the church is founded precisely upon the historical apostles of Christ. Here's the apostolic. Okay. Our Lord said to Peter in one of the most controversial passages in Christian history. He said to Peter, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Petros which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 18. And I won't get into the whole debate right now because that would be another hour and a half. But furthermore, it was Peter and later to the other apostles that Christ gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the authority to remit sins. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdoms from Matthew six 19. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So this is like the great, the great responsibility, but you know, fearful and wonderful responsibility that's given to the, those who are um, a part of the apostolic heritage of the church. These words were not spoken to all of Jesus' followers, but to those whom he had called to himself to be his apostles. Thus the Apostle Paul, who was called by the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2.20 Because of this, the visible, the visible unity of the church throughout history is expressed in terms of continuity with the apostles. St. Clement, third bishop of Rome, wrote in the year AD 96, Our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife over the title of bishop. For this cause, therefore, since they had received perfect foreknowledge, they appointed those who have been already mentioned and afterwards added the, the codicil that they should that if they should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed their ministry. Meaning, if someone to whom apostolic authority was given were to pass, then there should be others who continue that ministry. It makes sense. Because the church doesn't, just didn't just die out with the death of the apostles. So, and we're talking first century of Christianity here. And a bishop, bishop is a... a you know, a proper title that was given to leaders in the church from early on. Legitimate authority within the church is always derived from direct historical succession from the original apostles. This is called apostolic su succession. Or, um, so apost apostolicity is another, another word. Or apostolic succession. There's a direct continuity through uh, the laying on of hands and the bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Apostolic succession refers to the historical continuity of a given church with the original church in Jerusalem. 
Succession is traced through the line of bishops because the bishop is the sacramental head of the church. In the second century, St. Irenaeus of Leon wrote to combat heretics who claimed to have received secret knowledge passed on from the apostles. He argued that in each place where the church has been established, the historical links with the apostles are clearly seen. He says, those who wish to see the truth can observe in every church the tradition of the apostles made manifest in the whole world. We can enumerate those who were appointed bishops in the churches by the apostles and their successors down to our own day. Daniel, can you, um, can you go grab the list of bishops that's out in the narthex? Yeah. Now, where did St. Irenaeus live, though? Mid first millennium, I mean, like, what is three, four hundred? I don't remember. Uh, Saint Irenaeus, it, it was above one hundred. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is what he's talking about now. He's very early in Christianity, but we have here's the list of the bishops from the time of Christ and the apostles to present day. What does the term bishop mean? Bishop means overseer. Means um like. Yeah, um, it comes from Episcopos. Yeah, Episcopos, which means like a chief, like a chief householder, like a kind of actually originates from um, the language of servant servanthood. It, um, Episcopos would be the the chief servant actually of a particular household, and the church adopted that language. Um, so a, a bishop would be the. Uh, yeah, the lead, the servant of the servants of God, you know what I mean? To support and encourage them and to keep them, um, to help them preserve the, the faith. Where does the word pope come from? Pope means, well, it comes from the word, this means um, papa, father, a Latin term. What is it? Father, papa. Oh, I see. Puffed up. No, yeah, <laughs> puffed up it might as well. Uh, <laughs> But uh, if you want to look at this, I mean, this has this is the patriarchs of of the Church of Antioch, which we're a part of, you know, the continuity from St. Peter all the way to our current Bishop Patriarch John. So there's there's a there's an actual historical continuity that has taken and there's an integrity. There's an integrity there, meaning there's there, it's an integral whole. You know what I mean? A also, continuity. One of, also, one of your patriarchs. Of Antioch just so happens to be on that wall over there. Yeah, that's right. Yes, St. Ignatius of Antioch. So if anyone wants to see that, you know, we have it posted up in, in the narthex, in the entryway. And I think most people walk by and they, oh, there's some kind of little list of something there. St. Peter. St. Peter. So I thought it would be like Saint Peter and Paul. Yeah. 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 Peter and Paul. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we won't get into some of the details about the, you know, the. Also, the, John, also John was over there too, so you could say that all three of them, Peter, uh, Paul, and John, were evangelizing. And him. that's the thing. I mean, there was there was no claim to any like, no territorial claim that any of the apostles held. They weren't trying to. They weren't having turf wars or anything like that. You know. Yeah, but you know what? Christianity spread like wildfire, though. It's pretty amazing. So what has the church taught about Christ throughout the centuries? Simply look at what the church bishops have taught. In the succession of bishops, we see the continuity of the church's faith in life. And we're going to end pretty soon. I think we're going to find a stopping point. We're going to cover the first two of the four uh, characteristics of the, of the church um, although, I don't know, our next paragraph takes us right into the third element. We still have nine minutes, so let's, okay, let's see what we can do. So, what the church's bishops have taught. Now, uh, does that mean that everyone who ever held the title of bishop was automatically an inspired man of God? No. No, but that's one of the wonderful and important elements of the church is that people who, bishops, who were, you might say, like, bishops behaving badly. 
they have like sh shows or movies out there like, you know, something behaving, police behaving badly, you know, bishops behaving badly. Um, what happened to bad, badly behaving bishops? They were, they were remo removed. There's accountability. Because there is no such thing as unilateral authority in the church. There's what we call synodality or conciliarity. It's a shared, a shared leadership, we might say. Shared leadership. Because the only one who has true authority is Christ. The church is the body of Christ with Christ as the head. And so that is one thing that distinguishes the Orthodox Church, a huge distinguishing factor between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And I don't want to get into a criticism of Catholicism or anything in this session, but they do claim that there is a vicar, you know, an emissary of Christ, a, a, a singular authority who is the head of the church. And the Orthodox Church has never made that claim. There have been people who have tried to uh, claim that type of primacy, who have claimed to be uh, first without equals, things like that. That's what the, the, the Bishop of Rome claims, to be first without equals um, theologically. And we, we categorically reject that claim because Christ is the only first without equals. And then the people who are the shepherds, the chief shepherds and kind of, you could say, the governors of the church, they don't, they, they don't compete with Christ. I mean, if they do, they lose their way. And they fall into corruption. And then we pray that they will repent of their mistakes and their misdeeds. But it's, it's interesting, though, that when bishops behave badly, then other bishops can hold them to account. Other church leaders can hold them to account. And the, the people, too. The laity. The people who make up the body of Christ. They can say, you're... You know, there's an old, old term, anaxios. You know, you're not worthy. You are not. Because what makes someone worthy is their commitment to the authority of Christ and not their own authority. And if someone claims that they have authority, even if they claim that that's the authority of Christ, but it's not consistent with the teaching of the church, then they've fallen into delusion. And they need to be willing to be corrected by the breath of the Holy Spirit who speaks through the church not just through a person, again, even if that person claims to be charismatic and inspired, even if they have a really strong opinion, my conviction is this. And, they, and we say, no, that's not the consensus of the, that's not what the church believes. That's where schism takes place in the church, where people have broken away from the church. And that's actually the, the contemporary state of Christianity in the West it's just everyone wants to create their own version or be their own authority or develop an approach to Christianity based on what, they, what their conviction is. And there's a good intent behind it. There's a desire for something good, but it's divorced from the consensus of the church, you know, from the, the original church. And a lot of people do it in ignorance because they don't know. They don't know yet. <laughs> I always like to say yet. They don't know yet about orthodoxy. So... That's part of our job, is to lovingly, you know, share with people. They can't reject what they don't know. So, anyway, well, let's conclude there for today. We'll conclude there, and then we'll get into the other two aspects of the church's apostolic nature when we get together next week, and then we'll talk a little bit about missions and evangelism. I think that'll give us enough time to cover all of that. Let's conclude with a prayer together. And then I'll send you off with a little blessing that you, you have a, a blessed week. And I'm just going to keep reading this prayer for the acceptance of God's will by St. Philaret of Moscow at the conclusion of all of our sessions. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. O Lord, I know not what to ask of Thee. Thou alone knowest what my true needs are. Thou lovest me more than I myself know how to love. Help me to see my real needs, which are concealed from me. I dare not ask for either a cross or a consolation. I can only wait on Thee. My heart is open to Thee. Visit and help me for Thy great mercy's sake. 
Strike me and heal me, cast me down and raise me up. I worship in silence thy holy will and thine inscrutable ways. I offer myself as a sacrifice to thee. I put all my trust in thee. I have no other desire than to fulfill thy will. Teach me how to pray. Pray thou thyself within me. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, so Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. Thank you so much for being here today.